Aristide had telephoned U.S. Congresswoman Maxine Waters and told her that the chief of staff of the U.S. Embassy in Haiti had visited his home the night before and told him that if he did not leave the country, he would be killed. In February of 2004, Haitian President John Bertrand Aristide hastily resigned, jumped on a plane with his wife and children, and left the country. This was the claim that was widely reported in U.S. media. However, just a day later, Aristide spoke out publicly and said he did not resign willingly, but was rather forced out of the country in a coup organized by the United States. Aristide had telephoned U.S. Congresswoman Maxine Waters and told her that the chief of staff of the U.S. Embassy in Haiti had visited his home the night before and told him that if he did not leave the country, he would be killed. U.S. troops then forced him onto a plane and dumped him and his family in the Central African Republic. Then Secretary of State Colin Powell dismissed the allegations as baseless and said that Aristide had left the country of his own accord and that the United States simply assisted with the arrangements for his departure. To this day, Aristide insists that the United States was behind a coup that forced him out of the country. And if true, it wouldn't be the first time that the United States had interfered in the affairs of the Haitian people. In exchange for winning its freedom from the French colonizers in 1804 and becoming the first free black nation in the Americas, Haiti has been forced to repay their former colonizers an estimated $560 million in today's currency. Without the burden of this debt, Haiti could have added a staggering $21 billion over time to its economy, money which could have contributed to the growth of businesses, new roads, and other infrastructure that would have benefited its people. In 1914, the Wilson administration sent U.S. Marines into Haiti. They removed $500,000 from the Haitian National Bank in December of 1914 for safekeeping in New York, thus giving the United States control of the bank. Then in 1915, the Haitian president, John Vilbrand Guillaume Sam, was assassinated and the situation in Haiti quickly became unstable. In response, President Wilson sent the U.S. Marines to Haiti to prevent anarchy. In actuality, the act protected U.S. assets in the area and prevented a possible German invasion. When the occupation ended, the United States had gained complete control over Haitian finances and the right to intervene in Haiti whenever the U.S. government deemed necessary. The United States also forced the election of a new pro-American president that did not represent the choice of the Haitian populace and increased unrest in Haiti. An opinion piece published in the UK Guardian in 2012 said that while Haiti has been ready for democracy for some time, it's the United States that's not ready to see democracy in Haiti. Mark Weisbrot wrote that since the Haitians are poor and black, Washington thinks that it can get away with trampling on their democratic rights. A former Catholic priest, Aristide was an outspoken critic of U.S. foreign policy and was very suspicious of economic aid. And though he did not spell out a specific economic plan for Haiti, he made it clear that he supported the redistribution of wealth and favored economic justice over the open market system. In 1991, Aristide was deposed in a military coup widely believed to have been orchestrated by the CIA. In fact, in speaking to Congress, the CIA analyst for Latin American affairs, Brian Littell, had described the coup leader, Lieutenant General Raul Cedras, as one of the most promising group of Haitian leaders to emerge since the Duvalier family dictatorship was overthrown in 1986. The same CIA analyst told Congress that Aristide was mentally unbalanced and paid little mind to democratic principles. It's reported that several members of Congress were shown a document that claimed to show medical records for Aristide and that he was treated at a mental hospital in Canada. The claim of his mental illness and that he had urged his supporters to 
commit mass murder against armed opponents was widely reported in U.S. media. However, independent checks were never able to verify that Aristide had ever been a patient or been treated at the hospital that they claimed. Meanwhile, the military coup did not bring the results that the United States had anticipated. The military regime was reported to be one of the most violent in the region, engaging in a campaign of rape, torture, mutilation, and starvation. Eventually, the United States negotiated with the leaders that they could resign, keep whatever wealth they had acquired, no matter how they acquired it, and that they could choose to remain in the country or the U.S. would assist them to relocate to the country of their choice. Additionally, the U.S. began negotiating with Aristide for his return to the country, not because they were benevolent, but mainly because they were tired of Haitians arriving on the shores in Florida. The U.S. encouraged Aristide to refrain from engaging in what they called class welfare and seek more to unite the rich and the poor people of Haiti. So in October of 1994, Aristide returned to Haiti with America's blessing and Clinton would announce that Aristide had quote unquote embraced democratic principles. So why 10 years later did the U.S. organize for Aristide to be taken by force from the country? In 2003, Aristide had launched a public campaign demanding that France repay the money it had extracted from Haiti. France dismissed Aristide's claims as the ploys of a demagogue and portrayed the debt as simply a treaty between the two countries. When its role in Aristide's ouster was revealed, the French government said that it was trying to prevent Haiti from heaving with turmoil and spinning into civil war. It's reported that a part of the deal that Aristide made with the U.S. to return to Haiti was that he would resign within a certain period of time to make way for the actual leaders that Washington favored. The Clinton administration and the International Financial Institutions, IFIs, were carefully watching the Haitian president's appointments for finance minister, planning minister, and the head of the central bank. Two of the men favored by Washington to fill these positions had met in Paris with the IFIs to arrange the terms of an agreement under which Haiti would receive about $700 million of investment and credit. Typical of such agreements for the third world, it calls for a drastic reduction of state involvement in the economy and an enlarged role for the private sector through privatization of public services. Sounds familiar? Haiti's international function will be to serve the transnational corporations by opening itself up further to foreign investment and commerce with a bare minimum of tariffs or other import restrictions and offering itself primarily in the assembly industries as a source of cheap export labor, extremely cheap labor. Little if any increase in the current 10 to 25 cents per hour wages. A way of life promoted for years to investors by the U.S. Agency for International Development and other U.S. government agencies. So when you see the strife and political turmoil and civil war in Haiti, it's not by accident. It's because there is constant interference in their political affairs. There's constant in interference in every aspect of the country's leadership that prevents any advancement in this country. The United States, France, and other imperialist countries all want a piece of that country and they will not stop until they can install a leader that will cut it up into little pieces and give it to them. And when you see the poverty and violence in Haiti, when Haitians turn up at our shores in Portland, know that it's because they are fighting for what Jamaica has already lost.